Good day, colleagues. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about grapevine leaf roll disease and its management in South Africa. From the uh, onset, I'd like to explain that uh, grapevine leaf roll affects three different grape industries in South Africa, and each of these deals with uh, leaf roll in a different manner. Um, and the industries are basically the uh, wine industry centered down here at the tip of Africa, uh, table grapes which borders onto that area um, uh, is also produced in the Orange River and then up in Limpopo. And then thirdly, the raisin grapes which are also grown in uh, along the Oldefans River and the Orange River. The table grape industry do not consider leaf roll an important disease. Uh, vines are grown under very low stress conditions. Um, they are given plenty of water and nutrients. And consequently, the leaf symptoms of grapevine leaf roll are often quite mild on, on the table grapes and uh, certainly manifest quite long after harvesting. I'm not aware of any roguing and replanting done in a commercial table grape setting. Despite this lack of concern about leaf roll, we found that uh, leaf roll associated viruses, as well as a number of others, are actually prevalent in the industry during a survey that we did uh, two, three years ago. Uh, in a second project, we also found compelling evidence that uh, the um, very uneven ripening, lack of color development, um, and uneven berries observed in crimson seedless appears to be associated with the presence of uh, grape and leaf roll associated virus type 3. Table grape growers would benefit from leaf roll control, however. Um, the anticipated evening ripening of berries, uh, even colouring of the bunches, uh, earlier ripening are all properties which uh, would be desirable within this highly uh, lucrative export um, commodity. Furthermore, they apply very good mealy bag control as it is because of the best status of this insect within bunches. However, growers are extremely loath to apply roguing of infected vines um, uh, uh, based on the uh, monetary value that each individual vine uh, has for them. The raisin industry in South Africa is based primarily on white cultivars, uh, that is Selma peat and Mervine. Uh, and on these cultivars, leaf roll is um, not observed, even when vines are infected. Um, but despite this, there is some awareness of leaf roll, the effects on yield, um, and uh, there is a greater insistence on uh, the purchasing of virus-free planting material. This has happened in the last five years or so. No roguing or replanting, however, occurs in the industry. And in fact, it would be a very expensive exercise for the grower to go through as uh, ELISA tests would be required to identify the infected vines and the profit margins within the, radian, uh, within the raisin industry would be too low to worry. Growers in the wine industry, however, consider grapevine leaf roll to be the most important disease of vines, whether viral or uh, any other pathogen. Um, now, the industry made a very interesting decision about 20 years ago to not waste very limited uh, research funding uh, on actually determining how important the disease is rather taking a more pragmatic approach of assuming that it is really serious because the effects of the disease are quite obvious and then actually uh, funding uh, control, uh, research around control of the virus. Um, so all funding on research to control leaf roll in South Africa has actually been through the South African wine industry and most of our discussions further are based on 
our experiences in the wine industry. If not managed, the number of lethal infected uh, vines will effective dub effectively double annually. And this is based on an average of 55 minutes that were monitored over a six year period. In the example shown on the slide, you can see how it moves from 4% to 7, 15, 31, up to 43% rating. Now, the major concern for growers, um, they seldom look at the individual vine, but they really start picking up the effect of the virus once whole vineyards start displaying delayed or re reduced sugar development. Uh, and this happens especially so in cooler seasons where the sugar levels don't reach the required uh, levels uh, for winemaking. Uh, and then, of course, the yield reductions within such vineyards. So, in general, where leaf roll control is not applied, um, grapevines have to be replaced between 15 and 20 years in South Africa because they're no longer economically viable. This, of course, makes uh, it extremely uh, marginal crop to grow, um, seeing as the input costs in establishing vineyards are very, very expensive. Leaf roll also affects the quality of wine. Uh, colleagues of mine at Stellenbosch University uh, did an experiment in which they harvested uh, berries from uh, vines that tested negative for type three. Uh, these were harvested and the bricks at that stage was uh, 25.3. They infected uh, grapes from leaf roll infected vines. At the same time, these had a bricks that were lower at 23.1. And then they waited a couple of weeks to collect from further infected vines, uh, but waiting for the bricks to reach the same level as the healthy ones had been. Uh, then they produced wine from each of these three batches in a highly standardized manner um, and invited 30 of the country's top most uh, winemakers to come and evaluate the wines. The winemakers didn't know what the experiment was all about or what the blind, trace blind tasting actually involved. Um, out of a score of a potential 20 points, they gave the standardized wine from, from healthy plants 16.2, whereas both the leaf roll infected wines had lower scores. Also, if you look at the word cloud, the healthy vines had the um, better um, uh, descriptors, uh, flavor descriptors were much more clearly uh, defined and the wines were considered full bodied and balanced, all uh, very desirable properties. Whereas the leaf roll infected, uh, the wines made from the leaf roll infected um, plants were much less so. Now, up until around 2000, no specific leaf roll occur, uh, control occurred in South Africa. Um, so effectively, pretty much all vineyards older than 25 years are about 100% infected in South Africa. And even in um, vineyards established in the last 20 years, those that do not control for leaf roll still have the disease uh, in very high levels in the vineyards. And unfortunately, this is still the vast majority of our vineyards. And this is because uh, a number of um, growers provide their grapes to cooperative wine production. So they don't uh, have the effect of the uh, vine uh, poor quality themselves. Um, on the other end of the scale, there's very effective leaf roll control and it's near virus elimination, in fact, at own label wine estates um, that are on the higher end of the market. If you look at this background slide, every single vine or vineyard you see there is of a red cultivar in autumn when you would usually see the symptoms at their best. And you can see there's absolute absence of leaf roll. Now, 
The most important leafrel associated virus for us in South Africa is type 3. We seldom detect one. We almost never know any, any longer detect any two. And four and seven have never really been present much in the industry. If we turn our attention to the vector, the main vector is the vine mealybug, Planococcus ficus, which is prevalent on vines in all grape growing regions. And then now and again, we also get the long tailed mealybug, Pseudococcus longispinus, but this is more rarely observed. And then scale insects, which are also known to be vectors for type 3, are also rarely a problem. So, in fact, our the pathogen system that we're dealing with in South Africa is of type 3 and Planococcus ficus. This mimics the situation that you have in California, where Planococcus ficus has been introduced. Now, the control strategy we apply in South Africa is based on four pillars. It's an it's a integrated strategy. Uh, we find the greatest success where all four of these components are applied. And they need to be applied on newly planted vineyards or vineyards that have limited secondary spread. And I'll come back to this issue a little bit later. The four strategies or four components include planting of certified grapevine type 3 negative material, planting material, controlling the vector, roguing infected vines, and then also controlling vector dispersal from external sources. If, I, if we turn our attention to the first of these, planting of certified planting material, this is effectively a preventative strategy. And the way that our certification works is that we have a mandatory virus elimination step, followed by testing for the virus, and then propagation. Propagation is in three simple steps from nuclear material, which is derived directly from the plant material, which were subjected to virus elimination. These are really in insect free greenhouses. Then onto foundation blocks. And these are generally at plant improvement organizations. They're grown very often outside of traditional grape production areas. And they're also often grown or established at large commercial estates where the whole estate is applying leaf roll control. Then the final propagation step is in mother blocks. And these are on commercial wine farms where uh, the grower uh, produces grapes for wine and the nurseries buy back the cane material. Now, the virus elimination process that we use most commonly in South Africa is heat therapy and meristem tip culture, where you would grow vines in a uh, very high temperature, 30 degrees or so for three months. Um, this uh, allows the grape to grow very rapidly, um, whereas the virus replication doesn't quite keep up with the growth. So even though the, virus, uh, the vine might be infected, the uppermost meristematic tissue is free of the virus. By excising this and growing it up in tissue culture, regenerating grapevines from that, we can get virus-free material. During a recent study that we did on 97 of these nuclear accession plants, uh, using next generation sequencing, which would be capable of detecting all viruses and viroids, we showed that um, our nuclear material is essentially free of all known viruses, but that several viroids actually still persist, and they persist quite commonly in the material. Routinely, the nuclear material is tested for eight different viruses associated with um, various grapevine diseases, um, uh, looking only at the uh, leaf roll associated viruses uh, the nuclear material is tested for uh, leaf roll type 1, 2, and 3. Testing for type 3 uh, is conducted every five years because the nuclear material is kept in uh, um, insect free, under insect free conditions. In the foundation blocks, they are tested annually um, by monitoring for symptoms 
um, and this refers actually only to a limited number of red cultivars. And then alternatively, the other cultivars are all tested every three years. Uh, <clears throat> the same um, happens on uh, uh, mother blocks where they are tested uh, statistically for the presence of lupin. Uh, this is an example of the monitoring. And in, at this stage, it is only um, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Shiraz, Cabernet Franc, and Pinotage, which are allowed to have just monitoring rather than testing. And this is because these vines show extremely high correlation between symptoms observed and actual ELISA tests. Um, for all the other cultivars, uh, we test by ELISA for type 3. Testing is conducted uh, on two tiers. Um, initially, whole bays are collected, or up to 10 vines in a bay. Um, and then the bays are tested separately. And should an infected one uh, be found, then the individual vines within that bay are tested individually in order to identify the, the one or two or more that are actually infected. The certification scheme works very well up to foundation block level. Uh, this gra uh, graph illustrates a snapshot uh, of the status, uh, the incidence of lethal in such foundation blocks, so a whole 335 of them, um, ranked by age of the vineyard in 2015, uh, with the uh, oldest ones on the left-hand side at 15 years old, and the youngest vineyards of two years old on the right-hand right side. Um, the axis relates to the percentage of infection, and you can see the highest scale marking is only 0.6% infection. Uh, there are a few vineyards that exceeded this scale, and their numbers are indicated here at the top of the graph. Um, the vines, as mentioned earlier, are ranked by year, um, and then within any given year, they are ranked by the percentage infection uh, with greater numbers to the right-hand side. If we turn our attention only to, say, the nine-year-old vineyards, foundation blocks, uh, and there were over 50 of them, uh, you can see that the majority of them had no leaf roll in 2015. This is following uh, control of the, uh, of the material. And in fact, only two of them had instances of infection higher than 0.6%, so extremely low. Now, from the foundation blocks, uh, the mother blocks, as I mentioned earlier, are in commercial wine estates. And it's actually up to the grower whether he does leaf roll control or not, and the extent to which they do leaf roll control. Um, Mother blocks are scrapped once they reach a 3% leaf roll infection. Now, this is a weakness in our certification scheme. It would be far better if these uh, mother blocks were completely under the control of the plant improvement organizations. But the numbers involved just don't allow that. So um, because of that and because of the potential for reinfection, uh, we have to take into account that the virus can be present for a while, that we wouldn't detect it with PCR, ELISA, or even with symptoms. And I just want to point out that this graph is just for illustrative purposes. Um, these aren't uh, measured values. However, there's always still a chance that from mother blocks, some infected vines can uh, pass through onto growers. So we recommend growers, if they cannot buy foundation block material, uh, which is more expensive and generally only bought by the people who are very interested in leaf roll control, um, if they're getting material from mother blocks, we recommend that they, uh, on planting, also treat these vines with uh, a systemic insecticide. That would allow these vines to grow, develop symptoms, but not serve as a source from where they could infect 
surrounding vines. That brings us to the next act aspect, controlling the vector or millibug numbers. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, in South Africa, this is done by applying uh, imidacloprid, uh, neonic, um, on, uh, in a preventative or prophylactic manner, uh, where the growers would apply it uh, every three years. Uh, in recent times, we've also had the growers use Movento. Now, this is a big problem for leaf roll control in South Africa because these neonicotinoids have been banned in Europe and South Africa's main um, wine uh, uh, buyers are in Europe. So uh, we foresee lots of problems around uh, mealybug control unless we can get some uh, more effective insecticides. Um, Growers also do biological control, releasing either um, predators or parasitoids um, to control the mealybugs in a biological fashion. However, in our experience, um, this really works very well only once the virus is present in very low levels. If the virus is present at uh, medium to high incidence, um, the biological control is too slow to actually um, control the virus. We also recommend biological control or release of these parasitoids or, or um, predators when you have a neighbor who is not controlling uh, mealybugs themselves. So um, by releasing these predators on the boundary of your estate, which generally would have less mealybugs, these uh, biological agents move on to your neighbor's property and actually control the mealybug in your neighbor's property. On to the third aspect, and this is the roguing replanting component. Um, roguing works extremely well uh, for uh, control of leaf roll spread because the uh, foci of infection uh, caused by the spread is highly defined and actually relatively slow. If you look at um, this particular area, those purple and pink dots in the beginning were the sources of infection for each of these large clumps only five years previously. So um, had those vines been removed timeously, uh, all of these infections would have been saved. This uh, so-called secondary spread or spread that occurs within the vineyard itself uh, results in the largest number of uh, new infections of vines. We recommend um, roguing up to a lethal incidence of about 20% in a vineyard. Um, but this is highly dependent on the uh, amount of secondary spread that is already observed in a uh, at any given vineyard. Uh, the reason for this is that um, if there's a fair amount of secondary spread present, um, it, it generally means that there are many, many more plants that are infected than uh, are currently showing symptoms. In other words, over time, you will be removing many more vines than you see at the first stage of, of the uh, process. The uh, uh, roguing is also conditional to uh, very effective mealybug treatment, generally with a systemic insecticide or when uh, incidence levels are very low, also with biological control. The roguing also is very effective and um, economically viable uh, in red cultivars where you can see the symptoms and based only on symptoms, remove the infected vines. To illustrate the effect of the secondary spread uh, uh, incidence on roguing, um, I want to just illustrate two case studies. Um, in this first instance, we had an infection of around 12.2%. Uh, presumably at that stage uh, in 20, 20, uh, 2003, based on infected planting material. Um, these were rogued and subsequent infections are rogued as well. And you can see 
how the numbers dramatically decline with time. Um, in this instance, so where there was really no secondary spread, um, a, a cumulative 13.5, uh, 13.6 vines needed to be removed in order to achieve these extremely low levels of leaf roll infection. So in contrast with this, um, a second case study with vineyards established in 2000 uh, and monitored for the first time, first time in 2006, uh, contained a fair amount of leaf roll, uh, much lower than with the first case study that I showed you, uh, only having a 3.7% in infection. Uh, these were rowed. It's obvious here has uh, been some secondary uh, spread and subsequent uh, infections also rowed. Now, for this vineyard to reach very low levels, we required removing double the number of infected vines than were uh, present uh, initially or appeared present initially. Um, and this is purely because of the presence all along the way of a number of latent infections or in the beginning. Now onto the question of resetting of such road positions. If you've got clusters, so uh, this is very fine, but you can see the clustering of infection there. And you can see from the aerial photo, the clusters where vines have been removed. In those instances, replanting in that diseased foci that's been removed is very easy. Um, the, the, there's very little competition here in the middle uh, for these vines and they grow quite normally. Yeah, you can see how the gaps close up with time. That is not the case with individual infected plants. And in those instances, uh, replanting is much more difficult. You really can just replant in the first three seasons of a vineyard. Thereafter, you have to do additional measures. And some of these measures include having extra dripper irrigation lines, which feed only the rogued positions, or alternatively, large potted vines with well-developed root, um, well root systems, which are then planted into the large uh, rogued holes. The last aspect to quickly consider is the control of vector dispersal. Uh, in the first place, um, if you're replanting on an old vineyard, you need to control the leaf roll from that preceding vineyard. And the mealybugs can be on volunteer plants, or it can be viriliferous mealybugs surviving in the soil or on non-hosts for short periods. We understand this whole process very poorly. Um, but in spite of uh, not really knowing which of these uh, two aspects are involved, we are uh, utilizing fallow periods in which to first remove volunteers before we actually replant on, on uh, vines. Now, very often you will see gradients in new vineyards, and these are clear indications of infection from external sources. During a, a, during a spatial temporal study on 60 vineyards from 2001 to 2006, uh, we observed gradients in most instances of those uh, vineyards. And uh, in instances where the origin of infection was quite obvious, you know, you had a highly infected block right next to a new healthy one. The prevalence you can see is a little bit higher in those instances where the new vineyard is in the same orientation as the old infected vineyard and slightly lower where in fact the rows are planted perpendicular to the old infected vineyard. However, we also observed gradients where there was no obvious external infection source. In other words, the new vineyard was not close to a highly infected, previously infected vineyard. And in that instance, once again, 18% uh, of blocks, the gradient was along the rows, whereas only in 10%, the gradient was across rows. Now, this suggested that um, whatever was um, bringing in the, the, the in variliferous mealybugs um, had a greater propensity to move down the rows than across rows. 
and we believe that these border effects and gradients are probably due to uh, these very liferous mealybugs being brought in on implements and on workers. Um, no, we don't have any empirical evidence for this, um, and I would love to do research around this as well. Uh, but uh, uh, we are taking steps to prevent this theoretical movement of the very liferous mealybugs. However, it, uh, the fact that there's some spread over the roads also suggests that there are uh, vehicles that move across rows. And we have some evidence of uh, mealybug egg sacs on leaves that are blown. And um, in the case of Fergelegen, uh, which is the, the estate on which we did the lethal control first, we find, and, and in fact, where lethal is at this stage near eliminated, um, the levels are extremely, extremely low. We still find the odd infected vine seemingly not associated with any previous infection, seemingly occurring anywhere on that vineyard annually. Now, these are at very low levels. We've only found about 30 uh, vines annually uh, in a population of over 210,000 vines. So extremely low levels. We hypothesize that this is a uh, long distance dispersal of viriliferous mealybugs. This is another aspect that we would um, love to do some research on. So control to, it is essential to control the mealybugs in adjoining and distance and distant uh, lethal infected vineyards. Uh, alternatively, work in healthy vineyards before moving to lethal infected vineyards washing off implements between the vineyards. Now, the level of lethal control differs uh, slightly. Each of these steps has different uptake. Uh, the planting of certified planting material is at levels greater than 90%. Controlling the vector is done by most uh, growers or because it is also a pest, not just a vector. Removing infected vines uh, is actually only done by about 3% of the industry by by area. Uh, and these are generally uh, estates that um, want to uh, near eliminate the virus. Uh, this, as I say, they, this is primarily in the red cultivars. There's only about 10 estates that also do their roguing in the white cultivars. And they make use of our services to actually test for the presence of the virus in these white cultivars. Vector dispersal is done by very, very few of the growers, although they, funnily enough, apply the fallow period, which is um, actually quite an expensive control strategy. In a graph similar to the earlier one, uh, you can see that in commercial vineyards, and there's 119 of them, uh, and the level is at 1%, that in these vineyards, uh, based on, uh, once again, ranked by age, um, we have controlled mealybugs and lethal very effectively. Um, so in estates that it's done effectively, where all pillars are tried, um, it's becoming the exception to find infected vineyards. This is an example of a 24-year-old vineyard that's showing no decline in either yield or quality at this stage. The cost in South Africa of these control strategies is carried fully by the producers. There's no state subsidy. In fact, there's no state funding to, to conduct research on lethal really. Um, and the poor uptake, we believe, is really due to cash flow issues of growers. Um, the control strategy is relatively difficult and expensive where you have both infected vine, vineyards and healthy ones in, a, in close proximity. And very few growers can afford large scale renewal of vineyards, despite the obvious advantages of the economic longevity. The uh, implementation of all aspects of lethal control um, has been facilitated by the establishment of Bathy Solutions, which is a company uh, for which I'm now working, um, which is dedicated to supporting growers on all aspects of lethal control. 
Thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry I've gone over my time somewhat. I look forward to our question and answer session. Thank you very much.